today for the first uh, VEF in-person event since 2020. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Good to see people in person and meet people in real life. Um, and to those of you joining online, uh, thank you for logging on. Uh, my name is Jay Crone. I am a partner and investment director with uh, TELUS Ventures, and we are this season's presenting sponsor to VEF, and it gives me great pleasure to be the uh, MC for today's event. Uh, VEF is the Vancouver Entrepreneurs Forum, uh, a nonprofit society and Vancouver's premier networking event for technology entrepreneurs. Uh, founded in 1988, VEF has been bringing together entrepreneurs and investors alike to cultivate meaningful connections and create conversations designed to stimulate ideas. We host uh, eight events a year and we kick off our season in September. Uh, first and foremost, I uh, would like to acknowledge that UBC Robson Square is situated on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, uh, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh nations, and we're privileged to work and play on these lands. Um, housekeeping. Um, if you're familiar with our online events, you know we usually start off with a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, since we are in person today, there are a couple things that are different. Uh, we ask that you kindly turn off the volume on your cell phone so as not to distract the speakers tonight. Uh, but don't turn your phone off because we will need you to have those out uh, to use Slido tonight to ask questions. Um, so Slido is our uh, partner we use for uh, Q&A. Uh, it's S-L-I-D-O dot com. And uh, when you go to that site, you can use our event code, which is hashtag VEF. Uh, and you can use that to ask questions to our guests. So uh, we'll be having the Q&A in a short while, uh, around 6, 10 p.m. And whether you've joined us online or you're here in person, uh, you can use that uh, Slido uh, Q&A to ask questions. Um, our moderator will run through a quick demo of how Slido works uh, before the panel session begins. Um, I'd like to take a moment to recognize our VEF partners, uh, organizations who support uh, events like tonight wouldn't be possible. Uh, the season's presenting uh, sponsor is Tellus Ventures, of which I'm a refer representative uh, today, so I get to thank myself, which is always fun. Uh, and our other VEF sponsors include CIBC, Douglas College, uh, Corporate Recruiters, Faskin, Silicon Valley Bank, uh, Vantage Capital, Entrepreneurship at UBC. Um, our media sponsor is Vancouver Tech Journal. And thank you also to our delivery partner, uh, New Ventures BC, and to the VEF Board of Directors. Uh, we have a packed agenda today. Uh, and to kick things off, we're hearing from the five finalists of the Angel for Climate Solutions competition uh, as our featured lightning pitch uh, presenters. Then we'll get into our main event, which is a moderated discussion on catalyzing impact, strengthening our climate solutions ecosystem, uh, moderated by Ms. Michelle Sklar uh, with entrepreneurship at UBC and also a board member with VEF. Uh, at the end of the discussion, we will have our Q&A. Uh, so if you have questions, that'll be the time to use Slido and the hashtag VEF uh, code to ask your questions. Uh, following the Q&A, we'll ask you to break out into groups uh, for our conversation circles. Uh, this is a new format we're experimenting with uh, as an opportunity for you to connect with your peers uh, and share your thoughts on what has been discussed in the panel um, and uh, how your organization is tackling the climate crisis and hopefully have some meaningful dialogue uh, around how we can strengthen our climate solutions ecosystem. Uh, you've received a small piece of colored paper uh, cue the show the, the prop here, so some of these. Um, uh, and uh, you should hold on to that later, and I imagine it's going to have some connection with the colors you see on the wall. Uh, we then, of course, will have the rest of the evening to uh, network and mingle and celebrate our return to in person events. Uh, so let's uh, get started. Um, you may be uh, familiar with the Angels for uh, Climate solutions program, but if you aren't, this program was developed to empower angel investors to fund climate-backed solutions and inspire the innovation necessary to meet our climate goals. Uh, tonight you'll hear pitches from the five startup finalists. Uh, over $120,000 was raised from the investor cohort. 
uh, and was invested in the winning startup, Circular Rubber Technologies, who you'll hear from shortly. The format for our lightning pitches is 100 seconds, and I have a phone timer here to keep us on track. And that said, I am pleased to welcome our first uh, lightning pitch presenter, uh, Christopher Moreno. So Christopher, do you want to come up? One hundred seconds. Thanks very much. My name is Christopher Moreno. I am a CFO. I am an angel investor with over uh, half a million dollars invested in startups in the last four years. And I am also a serial entrepreneur with multiple exits. Binbreeze, our founders, you don't really need to know much about us, but you do know about composting. Composting is that process where you take food waste in your kitchen and put it in a separate bin. The problem with it is it generally stinks and it produces insects, most notably fruit flies. Well, we have a solution for that problem that is plaguing North America. You apply our Bin Breeze product, which is made from recycled wood waste and minerals, onto your compost. It immediately removes the odor and it kills the fruit flies. It also improves the quality of the carbon uh, that exists inside your compost. And as a result, we can actually provide a better carbon ratio by creating better uh, forms of composting. We're currently sold in 500 retailers across the country. We started off with five less than eight months ago. Sobe, Safeway, Canadian Tire, Home Hardware, PharmaSave. As you can see, it's displayed beautifully here in one of our local retailers. We we're at over $200,000 in revenue. And the big ticket item is that the product is now being made available to commercial operators. So big restaurants and mass produ production food locations are starting to use our four kilogram box. So why should you care? Well, because we are just now avail available to enter into the U.S. market. Thank you. We lower carbon, improve cr uh, food waste, and reduce methane. We're looking for $2 million to help us get to our B Corp and get into the U.S. We are Bin Breeze, and we make composting better. Thank you. Uh, up next is Paul Tournier from Circular Rubber Technologies. Hi there, Paul. There's about 100,000 uh, large mining tires every year that are being discarded and dumped into large mining sites. It causes all kinds of operational problems and it, uh, it uh, adds up to a pretty large um, issue with uh, regards to liabilities on the environment. In the meantime, 20 million tons of rubber is produced annually to create new tires, to build new tires. What CRT has done is it developed the cleanest technology to date uh, to convert the rubber in these end-of-life tires and create a reclaimed product that can substitute virgin rubber. The process worked, works as follows. Mining companies are paying us to detract the, uh, the mining tires from their sites. We bring them in, we shred them, and create a crumb. That crumb then goes into our proprietary process. This is where the magic happens. And the output is a, a reclaimed rubber that substitutes uh, the virgin rubber. By buying our product, the tire manufacturers are able to meet their uh, sustainability goals. And secondly, reduce uh, the cost of manufacturing between 15 to 30%. Uh, an additional benefit is that they can also speed up the process of curing the mining tires, which uh, leads to additional productivity. Thank you. We address about a two and a half billion dollar market in North America alone, and CRT is planning to capture about 2% of that. At the end of the day, we're an impact business, and the more successful we become, the bigger the impact is that we can have. For every tire that we process, uh, we create about 3,000 US dollars in revenue. We take about um, nine tons of CO2 uh, emissions out, and uh, that is the equivalent of about 450 trees that grow annually. CRT plans to have operations in eight plants uh, in five years' time, covering the, uh, the globe. Uh, we're aiming to uh, get to a revenue point of $120 million uh, with a gross margin of 26% and an EBITDA of 
And we're currently in the process of uh, raising our next financial round, and we're looking for $7 million to uh, kickstart our plant in Western Canada. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Soleil Giroudi from Solaire's Enterprise. Hello everyone, imagine if we could capture the sun's energy from anywhere. From windows, building facades, electric vehicles. However, we need a new material and technology to fulfill the requirements for those applications. Current silicon panels produce a lot of greenhouse gas emissions and have a really long value chain. Our perovskite-based ink allows for the fabrication of uh, solar panels that have the potential for two times energy conversion efficiency. Our goal is to produce a flexible film that is light and uh, has a high uh, efficiency. This requires us to develop a new manufacturing process using a perovskite ink. Right now, that's a few years away, but our ink is here and has been receiving a lot of interest from industry. So we started to start ink sales. Right now, we have 120 leads on a weighted sales pipeline of over $4 million. This is a $768 billion market. To date, there's only two competitors marketing their perovskite ink. However, their ink has a low shelf life and efficiency and is not scalable with large scale manufacturing. Our ink has high efficiency, high shelf life, and is scalable. We have a comprehensive IP strategy that covers 44 patent families. And our management team has experience with perovskite and thin film solar panels that will make sure that we develop the technology. Thank you. Right now, we're raising $2 million for a pre-seed round. We have over 65% of the round committed, so there's still room for investment. Act quickly, uh, because we're planning on closing the round in a few weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Blythe Gill from Tradle. So hi, my name is Blythe. I'm the founder and CEO of Tradle, a circular clothing platform for kids. And globally, we're sending, on average, one garbage truck full of textile waste to a landfill or an incinerator every single second. Why? Because this model is profitable. So the only sustainable alternative is to have a more profitable solution. So Tradle has uh, the go-to market solution of a circular clothing subscription service for new parents that makes it easy to have, use, outgrow, and then exchange clothes whenever there's a growth spurt. Um, <laughs> so yeah, as Alice says, there's less time shopping, more time uh, parenting. And uh, this service is more affordable for parents, but more profitable for brands. And the baby and toddler clothing market, zero to three alone, is almost $10 billion, where millennial parents are craving for a convenient and affordable solution uh, for their newborns. Now, to make this model work, we're using digital IDs to monitor and monetize the product over its entire life cycle, uh, incentivizing brands for durability and reusability, the opposite to fast fashion, which is disposability. And this model doesn't just apply well for kids' clothes, but it will be a model for all high-quality products designed for future sustainable circular economy. And we have a great team. Uh, we're still looking for a co-founder or a COO, if you know of anybody in this space that would love to participate. Uh, great executives, great advisors. And uh, we're in the textile hotspot, which is Vancouver. So we're hoping to connect with more uh, mission-aligned angel Canadian investors as we continue to raise $750,000 for our pre-seed round. Thanks. Thank you. Next up is Ishan Kohli from Skyacres Agro Technologies. Hello. 
Hello, everyone. I'd like to start off by asking you to imagine paying $8 for two tomatoes. You might think that this is some rare price spike. Maybe it was caused by one of those floods we had last year. But $8 is what people living in rural or First Nations communities are paying every day for two tomatoes, or $26 for a bottle of orange juice. This may explain why over half of all food insecure people in Canada are from First Nations communities, amounting to 2 million people. The cost of food transportation to these food deserts is the main driver, transporting food that goes stale even before it reaches places like northern BC. Processed foods are the only affordable option, making diabetes five times more likely in these communities. What if there was a way to grow high quality, affordable produce locally? That's where we come in. We are Sky Acres, Canada's first social impact vertical farming company. We set up vertical farming facilities in rural areas. We hire local people to run these facilities and we sell this produce directly to local grocery stores. We've developed an ultra low cost, 3D printed modular indoor vertical farming system that uses 94% less water than traditional farming and less electricity. Our design uses, allows us to grow 37 different pesticide free fruits, vegetables and plant-based protein. But our most exciting breakthrough allows us to capture carbon from the air and use it to speed up growth rates. We're working with the New Elk First Nations uh, community in uh, northern BC to set up a small vertical farming facility that can feed the entire community. Here we can grow the, those two tomatoes and have them sold for four dollars instead of eight, cutting costs in half. Just three strategically placed facilities generate a $20 million annual market opportunity with facilities breaking even as early as year two. We're currently raising $1.2 million. My team of vertical farming uh, experts and indigenous entrepreneurs I are, and I are on a mission to alleviate food security by making farming more efficient, sustainable, and accessible. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you to our lightning pitch presenters. Uh, those are some inspiring solutions. Um, and now it's time for our main event. Uh, pleased to welcome our panelists up to the stage uh, and to have a seat. Uh, as they're getting settled, tonight's topic will explore the funding landscape of impact-driven companies, uh, building and strengthening our climate um, solutions ecosystem. From transformational startups whose path to commercialization have never been more urgent to government procurement strategies and the needs for our natural resource industries. BC is home to an ecosystem of clean tech companies that are looking to shift this trajectory. And I believe we're poised to make a significant global leader in the space. Uh, I will now turn it over to our moderator, Michelle Sklar, to take it away. Here you go, awesome. Michelle. Thank you so much, Jake. That's wonderful. Good evening, everyone. If I can have my panelists bring me up on stage, please. Those lightning pitches were phenomenal. Congratulations to all of you. That was great. Um, so yes, good evening everyone. My name is Michelle Flar. Uh, and I don't have a mic. I forget my words are really loud. <laughs> Thank you. You don't have a mic. You can do it to me in the <laughs> Who's a first time at an in-person event? This girl. Um, anyways, good evening everyone. My name is Michelle Sklar and I am um, an entrepreneur in residence with Entrepreneurship at UBC. Um, and I'm also a board member of the Vancouver Entrepreneurs Forum and I'm really thrilled to uh, be here this evening and to, uh, to host this amazing panel. So, um, as we get started, and actually note, you need to hold the mic really close because when you hold it far away, nobody can hear you, so lessons learned there. Um, okay, so a couple new things that we're doing this evening, um, in addition to the conversation circles that were shared with you earlier, um, we're also gonna be using Slido for our Q&A. Now, is there anyone here that's actually used Slido before? Okay, so many of you have. If you haven't, um, you can actually snap a picture of that QR code. It'll open up on your device right away. Um, you can also go to Slido, S-L-I-D-O dot com, and that'll open it right up. You can just put in the hashtag or pound V-E-F, and that'll bring you right to um, the Q&A, and you'll see there's an option there to pop in some questions, um, which you can do as we are um, getting into our conversation today. Does anyone need me to do a dry run, or do you think that you can figure it out or bug a neighbor and you're good to go? All right. Awesome. Wonderful. Okay. Um, so let's get started. So... 
Um, you know, this evening is really about um, bringing together kind of representatives of our um, climate solutions ecosystem. And so as we get into our discussion this evening, um, you'll get a sense of where the expertise are for each one of our panelists. Um, so we're going to get into some moderated conversation, and then we're going to have some, some Q&A there. Um, and this is about how are we catalyzing impact? How are we strengthening our ecosystem? What are all the necessary pieces that we really need to have in place? So that's what tonight's discussion is all about. Um, and I'm going to uh, kick things off um, by asking our panelists to introduce themselves. So first, we'll start on my right here with Miranda Aldrich, who's the Chief Business Officer of uh, Bioform Technologies. So if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for having us here tonight. It really is very exciting to be actually back with uh, real live people. So I've been, uh, I guess, uh, almost 25 years now in the tech ecosystem in Vancouver, spending a lot of my early career with uh, Creo and most recently the last nine years with Copperleaf Technologies, uh, building out the services team there um, as uh, president of the Americas region and finally as, as president of the company. And really excited now to be joining Bioform. Um, Bioform is uh, working to replace single-use plastics with a combination of kelp and wood fiber. And this is really important to me as somebody who has spent all of my life, you know, really loving the natural environment and particularly our oceans. I've been a diver for many years and also open water swimming and kayaking. And it's just tragic seeing the impact of, of climate in general, really seeing how the biodiversity in our oceans has changed over the last, you know, decade, two decades. It, it's quite horrifying and particularly seeing the impact of plastic has, has been a huge motivation for me to get involved in, in the climate ecosystem here. Thanks so much, Miranda. Uh, next, over to uh, Dr. Shannon Bard, um, if you can please introduce yourself. Thanks so much, Michelle. Michelle and I work together at Entrepreneurship at UBC, and uh, I lead the Climate Venture Studio there. Um, I was previously a professor of environmental science at Dalhousie University, um, but I also spent uh, over 10 years uh, working with uh, engineering and environmental consulting companies, uh, being global director of innovation. Um, uh, for a sort of mining focused company. So building uh, industrial academic partnerships and uh, basically building little tiny startups, uh, about a hundred of them within uh, our larger company. So my work um, is a combination of trying to really understand the mechanisms of how we're impacting the world. I'm an environmental toxicologist and a marine biologist, but also a biomedical researcher. So um, I look how you can understand mechanistically how the world works and then translate that into language that the public can understand and regulators can understand and then package it in ways that it meets the mandate of the regulators and figure out how we can actually change the world and transform the world. So figure out how we can actually get research into the hands of decision makers so we can have science-based decisions made uh, for ecological health and for human health. Thank you. Awesome, thanks so much, Shannon. And uh, next up we have Javaria Veltkamp, who is uh, newly the Chief of Strategy and Operations with NBC. So if you could introduce yourself as well. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, first of all, it's a privilege to be here amongst so many innovators. So it's really great to hear all the pitches, the stories. I'm privileged to be part of this group. I guess if you had to put me in a bucket, it would be economist. That's my training. Um, Michelle had asked us earlier on sort of what catalyzed your participation in this climate economy. And for me, I grew up kind of traveling the world. We lived in Saudi Arabia. We visited, my family's from Pakistan originally. And I just saw how, you know, even in the desert, people can live in these thriving, vibrant, Bedouin, nomadic communities. Um, on very little if you allocate resources really well, don't waste anything and have every voice at the table to participate in the decision making. So that sort of prompted me to pursue economics. Somehow I found my, found my way into that and I um, specialized in sustainable development, which, you know, at the time, and I think it's very relevant today still is how do you meet the needs of today without compromising the needs of tomorrow or the needs of people in other parts of the world um so that and i think we all rely on this one planet um and climate uh, climate is very important i feel it can take up space in the room but climate is so intimately linked to society to health so 
Um, I think it's a really amazing time to be thinking in terms of systems. Um, and uh, I think we have never challenged our brains as much as we do today trying to solve the problems that we have. Awesome. Thanks, Javaria. Um, and lastly, we have Mike Winterfeld, who is managing partner of Active Impact Investments. Hey, everybody. It's great to, uh, it's great to meet all of you. And it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a real honor for me to be on this stage because I care so much about environmental sustainability. And so um, this has sort of been a, a dream of mine to try to take part in this in, in any way that I could. And um, so, as mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm the founder and, and managing partner of Active Impact. Active Impact is Canada's largest climate tech seed fund. Um, and we're still relatively new. We, um, we started the business about uh, five years ago. Um, we have two funds under management, so 70 million in, in assets that we're looking to deploy to, to create climate tech solutions across North America. Um, we've made 20... Four investments so far. Um, I had to pause for a second because it's actually been a pretty busy last couple of weeks uh, with with a couple of recent ones closing. Um, but yeah, I, the the I guess the perspective I'm trying to bring to this is um, is I had a career in a variety of different businesses, decided I cared about climate, and didn't know how I could participate. Um, didn't know whether that was you know, do I donate? Do I invest? Do I join one of these companies? Do I start one of these companies? And um, the brutally honest truth was I just couldn't think of a good idea of a company. So I really commend the founders that just gave their pitches and did a great job. Um, for me, I realized I was, uh, I was a guy who was, you know, leading teams and trying to fix businesses and grow businesses. And I really loved doing that. And I just wondered if I could apply that to, uh, you know, helping companies that were trying to solve the climate crisis. And so that's where the idea was born was, you know, can we drive more money towards this problem? Um, and can we try to drive more talent towards this problem? And, uh, and, and that's the role that we try to play as, a, as an active VC. Awesome. Thank you very much. That's great. Well, we have about 30 minutes for our conversation, so I'm going to dive right in. Um, the first thing that I was hoping that maybe each of you could kind of share your perspectives around is how have you seen the BC ecosystem evolve over the last, you know, five to 10 years and things can sometimes feel like they go really quickly or they go really slowly. So maybe what are some of the flashpoints that have stood out for you? And Miranda, maybe we'll, we'll start with you. No, excellent. I mean, I think it's been really great to see the diversity of startups that has grown over the last number of years and really lots of great ideas coming out to the community here in BC. And, um, you know, also it, it's been really fascinating for me joining the ecosystem at UBC and seeing the wonderful support network that's uh, been available. And I was just uh, talking to Michelle before the event. The coming into Bioform, I've been just blown away by all of the help that we've gotten from, from UBC and also from the community at large. So yeah, really some, some fabulous progress. Um, I think there, there is quite a bit for us still to do in terms of really looking, you know, not just in the academic community and in the existing technology community, but out into society at large and figuring out how we can capture some of the great ideas that people who are in various segments of the community living with some of the climate challenge have around how to solve those problems and, and really try and collect a lot of those lived experiences into people who perhaps can, can help in solving those challenges. Awesome, thank you. Shannon, what are some insights you could share with us that you've seen? Yeah, absolutely. Just building on Miranda's comment there about um, some of the lived experiences that all of us have had in the last year or so with the very extreme uh, weather uh, challenges that we've had. This has been something that brings it into play <clears throat> when people realize actually we do need to make a change now. And often it has to be quite personal to make that change. But we've seen um, with the change in government provincially to the NDP, every mandate uh, letter that went to every ministry had the environment mentioned in it. Now, um, that doesn't mean they have to do their promises, but it's certainly a step in the right direction. And the Climate Action Secretariat actually meets with five major uh, ministries 
every single month, and they're trying to align what they're doing. So as many of you know, um, no one does anything for the environment unless the government forces you to do it. So in the work that I was involved in, in research translation, trying to get that research into the hands of decision makers was so challenging when there was no market. No, no market meaning there wasn't an environmental uh, regulatory stick to force their, uh, an industry, for example, not to pollute, or to stimulate a circular economy, or these various things. Um, because in many cases, you need to have that stick, as well as some, as well as some carrots, some, some incentives, to actually put in the mind of people on that industrial side that, in fact, uh, there's a different way that you can do things. And once you've done it that way once, then they're much more open to adoption and realize, oh, wait a minute, you mean actually being more efficient and not polluting means that we actually are more efficient in the use of our stock materials, which are very expensive. And then the, the pricing, uh, I sort of just follows along in that way. So I think we're, um, we're in a really interesting time right now that um, uh, we are seeing that we can we can move towards the um, uh, economic green recovery, and at the same time, we're also using that as a way to address uh, some of the challenges under UNDRIP and reconciliation, because uh, as was described in some of the pitches, uh, there are huge problems with, with food security, energy security, water security in remote <coughs> communities, which means those are communities that you can pilot these kinds of solutions economically, but you can't do that in the lower mainland. So we want to look at the challenges, but also turn that on its head to become an opportunity. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Janet. Yeah, Jabaria, go ahead. Um, I'm going to tell a little bit of a longer story, but it's a story I really I love sharing. Um, the green building sector in Vancouver, BC, really prominent, really great um, engineering and expertise and innovation. And if you think of where it started, I think sort of 90s, 80s, 90s, we had the leaky condo crisis. And we had this engineering expertise that was focused on solving this really big challenge. Around the same time was Kyoto Protocol and a real focus on greenhouse gases and also buildings, one of the largest contributors, 40% to greenhouse gases. So when they fixed the leaky condo crisis, what I hear from some of the engineers who were there, they were like, well, what's the next problem we have to solve? Let's solve building envelopes. Let's make them really efficient. Let's reduce greenhouse gases and improve the energy performance of buildings. So I tell that because now you fast forward to today and you have from that kind of nugget, all these other industries that are spinning off, you can look at prefab manufacturing, you can look at what Nexi is doing, it's evolved into like embodied carbon and how do we solve you know, concrete and cement. Um, and so I think any innovation that we're looking at now, it really, if it's solving some of society's biggest challenges, it can, it, it's, it's amazing. We have to be able to sort of expand our thinking to think where things might end up. Awesome, thank you. Mike, what have you seen? So um, there's a reason that we're called active impact investments and not active climate investments. And it's because five years ago, even though my biggest passion was around climate change, we didn't know if there would be enough companies to invest in. And so we, we launched our first fund as a, a broad impact thesis fund. And luckily we were able to find you know, mostly climate solutions, but um, we, we, we did do a few other kinds of deals. And so. You know, one thing that has changed certainly in the last five years is a very high degree of confidence that there are plenty of incredible founders and companies and ideas and, and, and giant markets around climate. Um, second thing was um, we had to do a lot of convincing in the early days that, um, that this was not charity. <laughs> Um, so five years ago, I spent most of my time doing education to investors and trying to sort of show other people who, who went before us and who had showed positive returns and, and show that it didn't need to be what they call in the investment world, a concessionary return, uh, fund that you could actually compete with the rest of the market or, you know, potentially even have edge against the rest of the market. So we saw that. Um, and then now it's actually become you know, a big uh, movement, as you've seen, right? So last year, $408 billion was invested in climate tech, which was a little double, a uh, little over double the year before. So it's, it is uh, probably the fastest growing segment in investment. We still need more than that, to be clear. Um, but 
you know, it's sort of moved into the ranks of, you know, 10 years ago, cloud technology was something to invest in. Last year, crypto and weed was something to invest in. This year, climate is something to invest in. So it's become um, a household name where people are recognizing, like, this is a way that I can, you know, do two things at the same time. I can, you know, potentially make some financial returns, but I can also, you know, contribute to something that I really care about. Um, where I might leave you with a little bit of a challenge and, and, and why we've chosen to, to really focus on the seed stage is when you think of big numbers like that, $408 billion, most of that is downstream. So most of that is reserved for giant investments, um, you know, multi-hundred million dollar investments, billion dollar investments. And that's just not where, you know, that's just not where innovation starts. Like innovation starts with, you know, small companies, pre-seed stage, seed stage, you know, 10 people, 20 people, just trying to get their first, you know, a uh, few customers and their first few hundred thousand dollars in revenue. And so that's, that's where we've decided to stay, you know, even if we can continue to scale, which I hope we can, in terms of the asset center management, we, we would really like to continue to stay focused um, in this part of the market that we see being underserved. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. So actually, that sets us up for um, uh, the next uh, uh, topic I wanted to cover, which is kind of a bit of a state of the nation and, and um, just sort of riffing off of what you were um, speaking about, Mike, as far as like the early, the early pipeline stage of things. And so, Shannon, in your role working with research translation, so the very beginning of the innovation pipeline, what are you seeing are the gaps that are there today that we need to yeah. solve for? So we've got some significant gaps earlier than the seed stage. And part of this has to do with the nature of the funding for research translation. So you start off with basic research, and there's good funding for that. Then you move to applied research, and it's a little bit less. Uh, and then when you get to the seed fund, you start to get funding again. And the problem is you have this early valley of death, the first valley of death, um, where um, there are some really good ideas, which if you're fortunate enough that you have access to a laboratory, uh, you have family and friends that can support you, you have a spouse that's going to pay for your mortgage, you can float yourself through that and bootstrap it to get to the point you can get other investors to get interest. The problem is that we need more shots on goal. And that system uh, uh, favors those that happen to have chosen their parents right and chosen their community correctly um, and so for the rest of us uh, you know if you're an international student or if you uh, come from a, a lower socioeconomic class um, that we don't have those family and friends you're actually sending remittances home or if you're a single parent uh, there are all of these additional financial stresses that mean that these really great ideas with these founders they often fall through the cracks at that point. And in some cases, it might only be $50,000 that we need. So some of the work that we're actually doing, um, both at Entrepreneurship at UBC, but also collaborating uh, across the ecosystem with UBC, uh, sorry, with UVic and with SFU, is actually looking to see how we can align our innovation <laughs> policy and our funding for innovation with our climate policy. Because we need to have more shots on goal, and we need to have a more diverse set of um, uh, founders that are bringing those shots on goal. So we're looking at questions in, in, in many, different, many different ways. So we have a, a real resilience in, in the way that we're looking at that. So we're trying to fit those, uh, some of those uh, sort of gaps within existing programs, but also bring that to the attention of the different sort of funding agencies. That that earlier stage, it often isn't that much money, but it's enough to cover that 18 months or two years to get them to that stage feed uh, uh, area where we can actually launch some of these really important climate ventures. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Shannon. Um, Javaria, as an expert in policy and having the lens around procurement, um, how has the government been mapping out uh, innovation or climate you know, innovation policy in particular? And what are some of the key areas that companies should be focusing on? So how are we kind of bringing bringing both sides together, if you will. See, I'm not an economist anymore. Now I'm a procurement specialist. <laughs> it's lots of hats, lots of hats. First of all, I'd like to say congratulations to all of the um, organizations that Shannon, you've been posting on LinkedIn who have got so much funding and support and grants. And I just feel like it's gangbusters at the moment with UBC uh, yeah. companies. Yes, so we, had, we had two companies that won the X Prize this, yeah. in the last week. Congratulations. So, um, so now procurement. <laughs> you still want to ask that question? Um, I'll talk about policy. Uh, I think for 10 years, I ran a green economy strategy for the city of Vancouver. We grew green jobs 90% in that time. 
Um, and people would ask our team, how do you grow a green economy? And we would say there's three things, demand, innovation, and policy. So you have to have the innovation. There needs to be some shift. People want to have it, buy it. Even procurement can drive that. But supportive policy can also really drive that. And so, you know, sometimes that, that's in a space where, you know, there's people like the Koch brothers and others um, who are, you know, don't want any regulation. You know, businesses don't want this. But I think businesses will work with you to create smart policy if it creates like a level playing field. And that's been my experience. So two examples. Um, City of Vancouver has a zero emissions building uh, bylaw and the province has a net zero energy building step code. And what these did were they really laid out, here's what's happening over the next 14 years, your buildings need to nudge towards net zero energy. So that's great. They did so much computing to figure out how they could get there with only a 2% premium on the building cost. They had to bring in other computers, apparently, I heard, to do all this computing. I was on mat leave. I came back to Vancouver Economic Commission where I was working, and I thought, wait a minute. They've modeled the energy, but they've also modeled all the technology things. So let's daylight that information and provide it to manufacturers, to service providers, to investors. So we created an app, and you can go on, and you can see in 2024, the bottom falls out for the really low-performance windows or the really low-performance HR heat recovery ventilators. So if that's what you're making, or if that's what you're bringing into the country, you need to switch around, I think it's 2024. So I think daylighting these opportunities and working, between, so it was two years the industry worked with the province on that code, um, but sometimes you miss the, the final step of the economic development. So you need to go in and say, here's the local cluster development opportunity. There was 150 window manufacturers in BC. I think two of them were making the kinds of windows we're going to need in 2032. So how do you work back and get people to retool, reskill, get the equipment, get the certification, the Energy Star, et cetera? So that's a missed opportunity if we don't then do that last step. Um, and then the other kind of really smart policy is we have it in BC. It's co copied from California, but it's the low carbon fuel standard. And this is kind of a way of making money out of nothing. So if you do, um, I think it covers diesel, gasoline, but it might start to include marine fuels and it, this could really scale up. But if you do some um, energy reducing, uh, sorry, greenhouse gas reducing projects like um, electrify tugboats or you know, get your electricity for the, the ship on shore rather than using diesel, you get credits. So it doesn't cost the province anything. You get these credits, but on the other side, you have this group creating deficits. So the fuel providers have deficits. They have to buy your credits. So they will pay, and that's how you can pay for your project. So I think there's so much smart policy that we can have that can help drive innovation. It takes a little bit of thinking outside the box. What I think it takes the most is not thinking government is over there, business is over here, human beings are over here. <laughs> like We're all kind of wearing those different hats throughout our work lives, our careers, our days. So. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and Mike, my question for you is, as an investor with a portfolio spanning North America, what can you tell us about the capital needs of founders looking to launch and scale climate solutions? And I also would like you to give some consideration in your answer around, do you think Canadian companies are bold enough when it actually comes to their ambitions? So what do they need and are they bold enough in what they're doing and what they're asking for? Can I ask, can I add a policy one before that really quickly? Yes, you can. Just so I got excited about policy for a second. So probably there's a bunch of people in the audience know this, but. Um, 100 companies globally are responsible for 71% of all the GHG emissions. And so, you know, I just, I, I want to be really careful as a fund that we don't sort of create this fallacy that we can invest our way out of this. Like, we, we definitely need government regulation alongside. Um, and we have very recent examples of this, right? Like, if a government says we recommend you wear a mask versus we insist you wear a mask, you see very different behaviors, right? If you say, I recommend you wear a seatbelt versus you have to wear a seatbelt, you see very different behaviors. Smoking, like there, there are countless examples of this, right? So um, our companies will also benefit through, you know, regulatory reform um, and, and it will actually stimulate innovation in, in some of the places that we need to see 
change if, if, you, if you create constraints of what's allowed and what isn't allowed. So anyways, please, uh, thank you for allowing me to get on my soap stand for a second on that. Um, so on the Canadian one, I can ask, answer quickly, um, Canadian companies are too Canadian. Um, so uh, for any of the founders in the room, if I can just ask you to please like, you know, dream big and shoot big and just know that your American counterparts for whatever reason are very comfortable pointing at this slide that goes up and to the right and claims, you know, a potential revenue number that's just astronomical. Um, and, you know, of course, investors are looking for sort of a reality check, right? So, so the advice I would give on that and, and that we give to a lot of our founders is look in the short to medium term for something that's very pragmatic, right? And shows that you're level-headed and shows that you're using the data and shows that, like, you can follow a plan. And, and so point to something you know you can get done in the next sort of three to six months, um, and investors will appreciate that. That's the pragmatic part. But the dream big part is, you know, Bill Gates saying that there will be a personal computer in every person's home when nobody owned personal computers. I mean, people thought he was insane for saying that. And now probably all of you have 10 computers in your home when you include your cell phones and laptops and iPads and so on and so forth. So um, I, I just think that level of aspiration, uh, I would love to see in some more Canadian founders. And you probably heard enough from me, so maybe we can skip the other part. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Thanks so much, Mike. And so, Miranda, my question for you is, as a seasoned industry executive and company builder, what are the realities that, are, that our climate venture companies are facing today? So I think, uh, you know, just to talk a little bit to what Mike said, I think it's so true that, um, you know, at almost all levels in companies and in the ecosystem, what is really compelling is that ability to make a real impact and make a real difference. And we have some really large problems to solve, really large opportunities that lay before us. So I think, uh, you know, the sort of, you know, dream big, think about the scope of what can be accomplished, that, that's hugely important. And in order to be able to do that within Canada, um, it's really about having that whole end-to-end -end capability. Uh, one of the biggest pieces that I think is, is important in building a company is having the talent available to be able to do what you need to do. It's, it's always really the, the biggest challenge is to hire the right people and to be able to afford the right people at the right time. And I think that's where, you know, a lot of what we've talked about in terms of the innovation pipeline, in terms of, you know, academia, being able to support early stage ventures is, is really critically important. But also finding a way as an industry to really create an environment where we've got enough critical mass of companies and enough critical mass from a funding perspective that we can create exciting opportunities for people to want to stay in Canada and continue their career here and develop to the point where we have a lot of that mature talent that can nurture the next generation of, of companies. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I want to I want to shift our conversation a little bit now um, around the, the the people side of things. And so, um, Javaria, from your your role that you're now in now with with NBC um, as a you know larger fund with a triple bottom line and whatnot, um, I was wondering if you could share with us. So, what is it that um, the companies that we're building really need to be equipped with? Right? What are the kinds of things that when you start to look at investable companies at that level, what are some of the really important things you're looking at? First of all, I'm going to say um, Leah, our Chief Investment Officer and our CEO Jill are in Seattle today. Um, and we are working on our investment policy statement, which will answer in much more detail, I think, the questions that you're alluding to. So I will answer, I suppose, at a high level. Um, <clears throat> and I'm in week four of my role, so please no forgive pressure. me. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, I can start by saying what uh, um, inspired me and what I'm inspired about with the role and the mandate of NBC. Uh, investing with a triple bottom line mandate is, I think, you know, I think that's the holy grail, right? Um, the role of finance uh, is to reshape and facilitate this green transition. And finance hasn't been doing a good job of that. And I think there are pockets 
that are looking at how do we recreate that. So if any people, anyone here is Van City member, Van City's motto, you know, financial force for change. Um, VCs that are investing with an impact, trying to do this differently, as you're saying, trying to show the risk return um, and show that this is a way that we will do business in the future. I think climate, you're saying is the, maybe you're not saying it's the flavor of the day, but it's here now. Why is it here? Because climate change is here. Like we've been talking about it in this, with this, you know, the long horizon, it's the tragedy of the horizon. We're discounting it. The horizon is here. And so we're having to very quickly reshape how we do finance, how we do governance. <clears throat> and so the thing that I left Vancouver Economic Commission two years ago on this kind of journey to understand how do we shift more capital into finance, I think a lot of people in this room are on, how do we shift more capital into um, climate action? And I think the things I learned were, all of us are learning this, but you know, don't discount anymore <laughs> because the horizon is here. Um, you can't use historic performance uh, to guide where you're going. So one of the most common things we do in business is look at comparables. What are others doing? What were people doing before? You can't look at comparables anymore because we want to do things differently. You have to be very selective about the kinds of um, people, you know, comparables you have in, in your uh, in your analysis. Um, and so, one more thing on that. One of the, the other refrains that we hear, right, in sustainability, what gets measured gets managed. So let's start measuring things. Well, who decides what gets measured? And so I think, you know, in terms of what you're getting at, like how are we reshaping how we do business, we have to reshape the values of our organizations. And um, the last couple of years I spent uh, with an organization called Canada Climate Law Initiative where we did board training with corporate directors to help them understand climate risk and their fiduciary obligations to provide oversight of climate risk. And if I'm not a lawyer, but if you look at this field of fiduciary obligation, it's, it includes climate, it includes environment. We're really expanding that, um, that a definition of, of what business needs to address. Um, and so I think different business models where you can put values at the heart, like cooperatives and credit unions, those are, those are really um, inspiring and helping us think of different ways to do business. Awesome, thank you. Um, and kind of continuing along that same um, vein around sort of that, you know, how are we sort of, you know, thoughtfully integrating our values into decision making. Um, Shannon, you, you know, you'd mentioned earlier, and I, I know that one of the lightning pitches also um, working with First Nations communities and how are we thinking about, you know, there's obviously global opportunities, there's wonderful global opportunities, but we have a tremendous number of opportunities here in our own backyard, especially in a resorts rich region such as BC and a lot of communities that are underserved in so many ways um, that climate solutions can address. But it can be um, the, the alignment piece around how is that solution going to be adopted? How are you aligning the work that you're trying to do with the values of the communities or the customers, if you will, that you are in service of? And maybe you could speak to that a bit. Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, as we addressed before and the, the lightning pitch and agriculture addressed, um, there are these incredible opportunities if you look at the price points to actually have climate solutions adopted in these remote communities that have huge issues with it, uh, being reliant on diesel, being reliant on importing food, etc. But one of the challenges that you have um, uh, historically uh, because of colonialization is that if you go into a community and tell them what their problem is and tell them what their solution is, there's not much of an appetite to hear, to listen to you. Um, so um, you need to have an understanding and, and, and develop a, um, a relationship with that community. And there's strategies that you can do that. Yet you have to build trust and you have to um, build that based on shared values. Uh, so, um, and, and part of it is that you need to find a way that you can actually co-develop. First of all, you need to do customer discovery uh, to really ensure that what you think is their biggest problem actually is their biggest problem, and they've told you that that's their problem, and then co-develop what that solution is going to be in a, in a way that's culturally sensitive 
and also will leave some wealth in the community. So how can you work with the Economic Development Co uh, Commission with the particular brand, uh, uh, band or tribal council so that there's actually uh, entrepreneurship that's happening in that community such that they can uh, actually build wealth and, uh, and, and perpetuate some of that within the community. And they may even have businesses that they can then service and provide uh, products and services to some of their neighbors uh, in neighboring communities. So we look, wanna look at ways that we can actually build that wealth and build that capacity building uh, within these remote communities, again, looking at it as an opportunity, but also as a way that we can have economic and cultural reconciliation. So how can we use economics and finance as a tool to help us along that road uh, of reconciliation? Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Um, and Miranda, my question for you um, is, you know, when, when you're looking at your market access and customer opportunities with regards to Bioform, how are you thinking about kind of like local versus global, and um, are you are the decisions based on are, are the opportunities that are available based on like what might be easier to get into in one market over another market, and is that how you're making decisions as to where you know you're taking your product? I guess it's a bit of a sort of a procurement and and kind of market access question. Yeah, no, it's it's a good question. I I think. You know, whenever you have the opportunity to really work first in your own backyard, it just makes it so much easier to iterate quickly on the solution that you're building. So even if you are, as, as we are, looking to do something that really does solve a global problem and have a lot of potential to, to scale, really finding lead customers, finding people to do early stage testing with you in the local community is tremendously advantageous. And, uh, you know, in terms of some of the early go-to-market efforts that we're looking at at Biofarm, that's definitely something that we are working to do is to partner with local farmers, uh, local brands, local food service operators. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and my last question is for you, Mike. And I was wondering if you could share with us around, you know, when you are looking at um, the metrics that matter and the kinds of things that you are measuring as an investment firm, but that is an impact investment firm, how are you reconciling, I guess, the financial with the non-financial metrics? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so for us, it's... it's um, it's pretty binary at the beginning, right? So when, and when a company first comes to us, the very first thing that we're checking on is whether we think it could have a, like a really large um, at scale difference when it comes to GHG emission reduction, climate change in some sort of way. So we might be looking at uh, kilograms of waste averted, but you know, for us right now, a little bit of the, the North Star has been around GHG emission reduction. Um, but after we sort of um, uh, believe that story, then we do move into more traditional sort of financial metrics and just trying to see if this company we think could be a winner. And we, and we do that because, um, to be honest, like that's where we think that the scale can come from on, on the impact side as well, right? You know, if, you're, if you're a company that is not going to become financially successful, you're probably not ever going to, to, to reach the kind of scale that we would, we would hope that you could have. Um, but when we first started the fund, um, you know, there's so many frameworks out there and, and we've tried to kind of, you know, endorse and participate in a lot of these frameworks. Um, but I, I will say after doing this for a few years, you just realize you, you kind of have to meet the founder where they are on this. And, you know, if you think about a small company that, uh, you know, there's a tremendous amount of uh, alignment and agreement on how financial accounting should be done. Um, and even with that, small businesses are struggling to sort of, you know, have accurate depiction of what their, their, their finances look like. And so for us to, you know, impose upon them sort of like a very rigid structure around what their impact metrics would look like, we decided was not the right approach. Um, and so we focus on sort of a primary uh, impact, like I said, typically GHD emission reduction and across our portfolio. And again, we're seed stage investors, so these are these are small companies. We don't have a lot of them because we've only been doing this for a short period of time. But just last year, um, our portfolio um, uh, was able to mitigate 150, 000, over 150,000 tons of GHG emissions. So as that scales, I think that, that, that starts to become kind of an exciting and promising number for us. Um, yeah, and just the final note I would give on that in terms of being quote unquote right would be to say, you know, I think we have some companies that come to us 
and um, you know they're they're going to remove like the amount of GHD that fits in that wine glass, and they say that they have it to like a 99% accuracy. And someone else comes to us with you know the amount of GHD that would fit in the city of Vancouver, and they have it at like a you know an 80 to 90% accuracy. And you're like, well. <laughs> It kind of doesn't matter how right you are. Like you, you got to be in the right. You know, you got to be in the right. Uh, you know, uh, t-shirt size of of scale. And so we're 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 trying to pay a little bit more attention to that. Awesome, great. Okay, well, um, now we're going to move over to the Slido Q and A portion of the event. So, not sure if we've got the Slido um, slide teed up yet. But if you've been sitting on a burning question. I encourage you to pop it into Slido. One of the, oh, look at that. <laughs> uh, and one of the things that's very cool is you can see you can vote questions up and down. So if there's something already posted in there that you're like, yes, this is my question, then you can just uh, you can just vote it up. So um, let's take a look. We'll start at the top here. So first question, with the current situation with Europe, how do you see Canada in meeting zero emission goal? How do you see the role of startups and investors in clean tech? Who would like to take this question? And since the next question is for Mike, not you. I will, I wanted to build on something Mike was saying, and I think it, it sort of relates to this question, so I'm gonna give it a shot. If it doesn't, we will, mea culpa. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, you started to talk about um, what are we measuring? How are we measuring it? And earlier, we, I was talking about you know, climate risk is here, climate change is here. And so there is such a sea change now as central banks of the world have coordinated and they see that, you know, this green swan event, some kind of climate related event could happen that could trigger massive economic catastrophe. And we saw it, you know, 2008 and with COVID, much, much worse than that. So there's this hunt now, right? Like where's the climate risk hiding? How do we find it? How do we measure it? And so there's this real uh, alignment in so many different facets of finance. Like COP26 was all about how do we price and put climate into every financial decision? That was the goal. Um, you can argue whether they got there or not, and they certainly didn't get to a good climate outcome. But I think that is so important. And so you start to see it trickle into other best practices and regulatory frameworks. So in the UK, all organizations that are publicly listed and, and pension funds and so on need to disclose climate risk information. In Canada, it applies to um, federal crown corps. Um, and I think they just announced that it may apply to banks. That I think is really interesting because when we talk about um, climate data, it's like, well, does your investor care about it or not? You can kind of pick and choose. Maybe institutional investors, pension funds, they're starting to ask about it. Maybe private equity doesn't. But your bank might ask for this information. So it's not just equity. It's also debt and just your loan from your bank because banks have to disclose where they're going to get that data. They need to ask their clients. So I think that's a real sea change in, you know, the, the um the value and the importance of tracking climate risk information. Awesome, thank you. You look like you had something you wanted to add to that, Shannon. Yeah, by I just all wanted means. to add add one piece of that is um, around what our interpretation of national security is. So, if we look at the the issues that are happening uh, in Europe, uh, if we had had a green transition, uh, you know, 15 years earlier, and Ger Germany was not reliant on uh, Russian oil, we would be in a different situation. And so. Um, we need to learn from that. And so part of national security is, would we be independent? We've already seen you know, how vulnerable we are when we're, we don't have resilient um, uh, uh, supply chains. So we need to have resilience for energy supply. We need to have resilience for our food and for, for many other pieces. And so we can align all those pieces together and show how um, uh, these climate solutions can help reinforce that. And uh, again, that fits back into the policy argument. Sometimes you just have to show that you have shared values uh, when you're talking about uh, security and how that comes together. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Okay. Um, looks like people are definitely taking advantage of the voting. So that's wonderful. Uh, next question. It's often said that the capital investment community in Canada is quite conservative. Is that changing at all with the urgency of the climate crisis? Would you like to take that question? I can, I can take that. Um, it is. 
It is. Um, I'm encouraged that it is. Uh, not as fast as I would love to see it, or probably many of the people in this room would love to see it. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, institutional investors, if they were to invest in a fund like ours, they would typically look for uh, a 10 year track record, um, which was very hard for me to wrap my head around starting the business and uh, realizing that is a real constraint. Um, but we tried very hard to help people understand that the climate couldn't wait that long. And there are a number of institutions that understand that. And so if you look at the formation of 90 plus percent of funds that are focused on climate, um, they're new funds, right? This is sort of, you know, an, uh, like it's not a new problem, but it's a new problem being addressed with, with, with finance in many ways. And so that emerging fund manager category, which we fit in, um, in our second fund, we were able to attract um, money from EDC, so the Canadian government. We were able to attract money from Fonds d'Action, so a, um, a Quebec-based uh, pension fund. We were able to attract money from uh, university endowments with UVic. We were able to attract money from um, corporate uh, partners like Van City and First West Credit Union. And so I would say that... Um, if attitudes hadn't changed, if the urgency wasn't there, that we might not have been so fortunate as to bring some of those partners into our second fund. They might have been in our third or our fourth. Um, and I'll let you know what happens on the third, but we're hoping we can speed things up. I just wanted to, to share an, an analogy to this. So we see that we get cultural shifts that happen about how, what values communities have. And so often a disaster has to happen before we change values. So, you know, the Titanic happens and suddenly there's all these maritime health and safety issues. Uh, the same thing happened uh, when we had the uh, chemical accident in Bhopal, India. So health and safety wasn't even on the radar. Uh, we had oil and gas. Quite a few people were killed in Alberta uh, in the 80s. And it wasn't until a number of people started getting killed and uh, your insurance rates would start to skyrocket that companies started to take it more seriously. And health and safety is now sort of the number one issue. You talk about it every uh, tailgate, you talk about it every morning at an engineering firm, uh, in oil and gas and mining and all of these different sectors. And you talk about you want your workers to come home safely. And that was not the conversation uh, 30, 40 years ago. So the view is if we can get health and safety shifted, can we not get environment shifted? And so the hope is, is that we will be there, you know, in another uh, five or ten years in in that position. That's where we want to go. But we we see these kinds of evolutions happening. So I think that analogy is similar to what can happen in the finance field. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. There are some amazing questions. So um, moving along. So Mike Winterfield mentioned last year, crypto was the thing to invest in. This year, climate is the thing to invest in. As VCs, is climate tech a fad or a trend? We probably covered that it's... <laughs> yeah, not, not a fad, uh, not a fad, not a trend. Um, no, I mean, I think very, you know, unfortunately, it's here to stay, right? Like, it's, it's, it's a giant global problem, um, and it's going to require trillions being invested in it. Um, but that does mean that there is economic opportunity for talented people that want to you know, get in, involved, and and it means that there's economic opportunity for investors that want to um, that that, that want to take part in this. But no, I mean, this is a sea change shift, as has been being talked about on uh, across the panel. That um, you know, we 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 included in our in one of our last decks this this quote from uh, uh, I believe it was Bill Gates who had said that like the next thousand unicorns, uh, so unicorns being companies that get valued at a billion dollars or, or more, uh, will be climate unicorns. And so, yeah, I think, I think there's just, there's a lot of investors waking up to the fact that um, this is where money is going to need to be poured. It's a giant problem and whoever can come up with solutions to big problems um, deserves to be, de deserve to be rewarded for it. Awesome. Thank you. We have an awesome question um, that, oh, it just changed. <laughs> there we go. It's back again. Okay. Awesome question up here. $44 billion got invested in Twitter, yet women founders still only received 2.2% of incentives of funding. Sorry, the questions keep moving around. How can we improve the case for investing in women and impact? Fantastic question. So who would like to take a shot at this question? I wish I could, okay, cha I wish I could channel one of my uh, colleagues right now. No, I can't answer the question. I wish I could channel Jill or Leah. I think they 
really great responses to that one. Anyways, that's a really great question. We have so much funding going into things such as Twitter, yet we have this climate crisis going on, and we are investing in seeing such a strange world that we live in. Um, but Mike, maybe you could um, share with us some of the things that go into how you approach identifying um, investments into female-led companies that, because we're really trying to drive impact here. Yeah, our, our, like our numbers are very different than the industry norms. So I mean, you know, internally our team is six women and four men, and that's unheard of in, in, in most investment um, uh, funds. And I don't know the stats off the top of my head. I'm, I'm looking at Elise because she's here and she would know these better than I do. But um, I know in our first fund, we were north of 40% women in leadership and we were over 50% women across the entire employee base. Um, but we've put a concerted effort into it, right? So um, yes, uh, we do get pitched by less women than men. Um, that, that's, a, that's a fact. Um, but it doesn't mean that by the time you try to, uh, you know, decide who all of the top people that deserve money are, that, uh, that it should be proportionate, right? If we, if we did that, if you like, that's the excuse that people will fall back on. They'll say there's less women in science and engineering, uh, which is a fact. There's less women in finance, finance, which is a fact, you know, there's less female founders, which is a fact. And so, you know, funds will say, we're just, we're investing proportionally. You know, we take the top 1% of men and the top 1% of women. Um, but that won't get you the right balance in your portfolio. Absolutely. Javari, you look like you wanted to hop into this I one as well. I started to channel Jill a little bit, I okay. think, I hope. Maybe she'll watch this and I don't know. But, you know, I think, I mean, you can expand that to kind of diversity and inclusion in so many other sectors where there is underrepresentation of, and not just women, of all kinds of diversity. And I think it's that thing again of self-reflection and what are your values. So, you know, power dynamics, every all the sort of recruitment process, communication styles, how we do pitches is so stylized around specific forms of communication. This um, thread on LinkedIn went viral last night. I don't know if anybody saw it, but it was talking about the brain power it takes. It was in this case, it was... Japanese executives looking at a PowerPoint deck versus the Western people who created the PowerPoint deck. And the communication style is so different and the language is so different. And, you know, we speak in so many idioms and, uh, you know, other kind of language things in English that it, it can be so inaccessible. Um, so I think recreating how we communicate, being really thoughtful of that and, um, you know, this is not specific to, to venture or to funding, but um, how do you create intentionality in your rubrics so that it's not just a gut check? It's not just the, you know, why are so many incompetent men becoming leaders if anyone's read that work? It's, you know, it's, it's, it's because we do kind of value charisma and bravado and it's the easy thing to go with, but we need to gut check and have something that will allow different communication styles to flourish and um yeah anyway. i i don't know if jill would have said it like that but. mike yeah well, i'll just i'll just good, good question this is stimulated some good conversation yeah i'll just add one thing for any of the angel investors in the audience which is say statistically speaking you're actually uh, more likely to succeed investing in women so um not only is it the right thing to do, uh, it, it should also actually provide better returns for you. And when we talk about it from a uh, diversification standpoint or diversity standpoint, it's also just, I mean, half the world is women and half the world is men. And so if you only invest in men, then do you really have the right perspective on what you can provide or sell to the world? Awesome. Thank you. And Shannon, you look like you wanted to hop in with something. And that was, and Mike basically said it, but when we have a, we have a talent pool and we want to use it as much as we can at the breadth of that talent pool and the frameworks that we have and the systems that we have, unfortunately discriminate against certain groups or um, elevate certain groups because of um, historical reasons. 
And so again, we're in this really, really difficult situation where we have a lot of challenges around climate, which means that we have to maximize our efficiency in using our talent pool. So we need to use um, uh, more different strategies in order to have um, look at equity, diversity, and inclusion so that we can pull in more people from our talent pool uh, so we've got more shots on goal so we can try to solve these problems. And Miranda, you look like you wanted to add something to this conversation, yeah, too. Absolutely. Well, I, I want to start by congratulating uh, Mike on doing exactly the right thing. I think it's just like when you're hiring, um, particularly for senior roles, you know, really challenging yourself and challenging your sourcing process to make sure that you have a diverse and representative pool of candidates that you're looking at even if that is more difficult than just going with the kind of more default homogenous pool of candidates. And I think that, that helps with the other aspect, which you know, comes back to what, some of what Shannon was saying earlier around empowering people who maybe aren't traditional founders to see people who look like them come from the same background as, as them who are succeeding. And that's, that's inspiring, especially when you're in a situation where it might be economically more difficult or culturally more difficult to take that leap off the edge of the cliff to try something speculative. I just add one more thing <laughs> on Miranda. Right it's just the concept of sponsorship. So um, where you're actually helping people by empowering them through sponsorship, where you're introducing them to people, it's a much more active uh, piece than just mentorship. And um, often uh, individuals that are sponsored don't even realize sort of the gift they've been given. And we all need to sort of pay it forward for everything that we were given to get to the position that we're in now. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I actually think this is a good time for us to um, bring this part of uh, the event to a close as far as our panel discussions are concerned and move over to our conversation circles, which is going to be an opportunity for any of the um, enlightening um, or, um, you know, controversial uh, topics that may be being kind of banted about here, if you'd actually bring these discussions into some smaller groups and share some perspectives. So again, um, we are trying something a little bit new, but I thought that as we're transitioning back to in-person events, what are some of the things that we've been doing online that have actually been kind of interesting? And so the breakout groups that we have and kind of those intimate discussions that we have, I think there, there's some value in that. So um, indulge me, if you will, and thought we would try it out uh, for this evening's event. So this is also an opportunity for you to expand your network. Um, I know I was speaking with um, several individuals earlier that had not been to an in-person um, event in quite some time. And so maybe you are feeling a little bit rusty in the old, you know, kind of networking and conversation starting. So um, consider this my gift to you um, to get those uh, kind of conversation muscles uh, back in action. So um, you can see that there are colored pieces of paper on the walls and you are all hopefully given a small colored piece of paper. So I think you can probably make the connection that you should take your colored piece of paper and walk over to the large colored piece of paper on the wall. And in doing so, that'll form um, some smaller groups. Um, I, you know, suggest that, um, you know, maybe there is uh, someone in the group that is as extroverted as myself um, that might want to kick the conversation off. Um, and we actually have a few questions. I'm not sure if we've got a slide for, there we go. So um, just some prompters, totally up to you. You can take these discussions any way you want, but I um, thought it would be great if you wanted to introduce yourselves to one another, maybe share some of your um, key takeaways or thoughts from the panel discussion. Um, perhaps you could share how does the work that you or your organization are doing fit into our climate solutions ecosystem? What problems are you solving? Um, and what is the one thing that we can improve upon as an ecosystem? And so... Um, for the next um, 25 minutes, I encourage you to have those conversations. So um, first of all, thank you to our panelists. Absolutely amazing. Big round of applause, please. Thank you. Um, can, I, can I thank Michelle as well for a wonderful moderating? This was really fun. I haven't been on a panel in a while, but this was really fun. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. That's very kind. Okay, let's have some great conversations, and then uh, we'll come back and we'll um, and we'll share what's on deck next. Thank you.